So what did the dolphin shout when he got stuck in the seaweed? What did the dolphin shout when he got stuck in the seaweed? Kelp! <laughs> Where did the whale play his violin? Where, these, are, these are San Diego themes because my kids are still, they told me yesterday, I don't want to go back to school. Did you guys say that? Oh, yeah. Call your parents and tell them that? Mom, Dad, uh, yeah. right? The most pathetic sounding cries. Like I just tortured them for the last 10 days. Right? Okay? Where did the whale play his violin? Where did the whale play his violin? In the orchestra. <laughs> All right. So some of you went to Mexico. Some went to Vegas. How many stay here and study? <laughs> Like two people, really? <laughs> Your friends Skyped you from Vegas? <laughs> Wish you were here! <laughs> Alright. So it's obviously true and unusual to have an exam the first day back. So we have it on Wednesday. We're going to cover today's material as well. No, it's not unusual and cruel on Wednesday because that's like three days later. You guys have to eventually wake up from spring break. Okay? Yeah, I know. I, I had this conversation my kids yesterday. So this material is game on. We're going to see how far we get. We probably won't get through everything in this lecture. That's okay. The portion at the end is a little transitional uh, material and topic for us to get into our next unit anyway. So it fits nicely in either this component or it fits nicely in the next <coughs> unit. But first up, let's talk about a couple of review questions. Some review questions. So here's an example of a type of question I could ask on the exam, right? Type of question I could ask on the exam. So the precentral gyrus is responsible for which of the following? A, integrating sight, sound, and taste, and informa uh, taste information. B, controlling your emotions. Like, not getting too excited about the exam. C, assisting in memory acquisition, remembering what you were doing before spring break. D, coordinating the rate and timing of breathing. You're not hyperventilating because you forgot there was an exam on Wednesday. Or uh, E, directing motor movements. How many of you say A? This is all class participation. How many say B? C? D? And how about E? Okay, why the E's? E's the right answer, why? That's where the primary motor cortex is, which is in the precentral gyrus. Now, I could ask the question about the postcentral gyrus, and the answer you would choose would actually be something that was related to sensory input, right? Okay, good. Um, how about. Hang on, my clicker is still on spring break. <laughs> All right, let's go. 67 year old woman experiences a stroke to her right temporal lobe. Which of the following will most likely result from this permanent damage? A, loss of vision in the right eye. Or, excuse me, loss of vision in the left eye. B, loss of vision in the right eye. C, loss of gustation on the right side. That's taste. D, loss of gustation on the left side. E, loss of hearing on the right ear, uh, F, loss of hearing on the left ear, or G, two of these. How, who has an answer and can defend it? You don't have gustation? What do you have? Touch. Touch. You have touch on the right side of your face. Uh... Okay, that's fine. That'll work. You can substitute that. So taste or touch, yeah. Where did the loss of yeah loss of hearing in the left ear and loss of just 
So it would be D and F, or you could substitute uh, touch instead of taste. Yeah, why? Let's let him finish his, uh, his thought process. Okay, so did you guys catch that? No. Uh, so the gustation is taste, right? And um, taste and smell are, are closely connected. We'll talk about that towards the end of the semester. But the temporal lobe is responsible for integrating information about taste, <laughs> olfaction, um, uh, hearing, as well as... Um, uh, uh, components of sensory input. Okay, so the question is really a sensory input question. Now, there's not going to be F and G options on the exam on Wednesday, but what I want you to be able to follow in the questioning is um, depending upon what part of the brain that I'm asking about, if there was damage to that portion of the brain, what would take place? And what would be the resulting cause? They're very clinical, I understand, uh, but this is cause and effect. I'm going to show you a map of the brain here in a second, and it'll have you being focused on what areas to actually study, okay? Now, let's look at this one. You have a brain lesion. So, if you have damage, if you have stroke, if you have a brain lesion, uh, if you have trauma to any of these regions of the brain, you should be able to figure out what the effect would be if you remember what that part of the brain is supposed to do. That's what we're doing right now. We're playing, okay, if this part of the brain is responsible for that, and I damage it, then that will be affected. Now, I also want you to be able to appreciate the right versus the left side, because the left side of the brain, motor output controls the right side of the body. With me? And the right side of the brain... Motor output controls the left side of the body. And sensory input is the same way. Sensory input from the left side of the body, it decussates or crosses over at the level of the medulla in the brainstem, and it innervates onto the left hemisphere. So when you feel something with the left hand, that tactile information goes to the sensory cortex on the right side. And then when you say that sharp and drop it and you move your hand, it's the motor cortex or the precentral gyrus on the right side of the right hemisphere. It sends efferent motor neurons output decussating, crossing over to the left side and telling you to drop what it is that you're picking up with your hand. Okay? All right, how about this one? We have a brain lesion. The patient never feels full and is extremely heavy. Okay? So, you want to answer this question? No, I don't know what the was Oh, you don't know what the answer was to last. Let's do this one, then we'll go back. So, brain lesion that controls appetite or satiety centers. Where would that be found? Is that found in the hypothalamus, the amygdala, the hippocampus, the basal nuclei, or the pons? A, who's got A? Why? What else does the hypothalamus do? What all does the hypothalamus do? <coughs> Thirst centers, right? You should probably write these down. Thirst centers, water balance, <coughs> pleasure, rage, sexual desire, hunger. There it is. There's your appetite center. Sleep patterns, temperature, and aggression. Okay. All right, well, let's go back. Um, so this question... The 67-year-old woman has a stroke to her right temporal lobe. So the question is, what does the temporal lobe do? That's a high sensory input lobe. And so the correct answer here would be D as well as F, because both hearing and taste centers are found in the temporal lobe. Okay? All right. Um, I want you to be familiar with these brain parts. With these regions of the brain that we went over in the preceding lectures, right? So we've got frontal lobe, parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, the pre- and post-central gyrus, which has been some of these questions I'm asking you today in this little mini-review. 
and uh, Broca's and Wernicke's area. Who can remind us what Broca's area does versus Wernicke's area does? Yes? Broca's area allows you to form language, and Wernicke's area allows you to understand it. Perfect. Broca's is towards the anterior aspect of the left hemisphere, so it's responsible for motor formation of words. Wernicke's is towards the posterior aspect of the left hemisphere. It's more sensory, more understanding of those words. So if you have a stroke or a lesion in either of those centers, you should be able to answer a question on Wednesday's exam. What would the result be? These are like huge hints, guys, for Wednesday. So if your friends aren't here, you might want to write it down for them. Okay? When it comes to a stroke, would the effects be different in Broca's and Wernicke's area? No, well, they would be different. I mean, Broca's would be motor speech, and Wernicke's would be understanding what the speech is. Would they both be affected? Well, no, you can have a stroke in just the front portion or the back. Strokes are um, unpredictable. We don't, some strokes are lethal. The patient never survives. So a patient that has a speech impediment or has an awkward arm or an awkward limp because they had a stroke, those are fortunate patients because it didn't kill them. Does that make sense? So depending upon what region of the brain the stroke affects, you're going to have a totally different result. Okay. So on the exam, if you ask a question with the stroke, like you'd say... The I would say what area was affected. Yeah, absolutely. I'd have to. Okay. Otherwise, you'd have no way to answer the question. And, and if I don't do a good job of it, raise your hand and ask me. No. No, just the language centers are on the left side. Yep. So the question was, does Broca's and Wernicke's area exist on both hemispheres? The answer is no. The, the language centers are focused in the left hemisphere, the left side of the brain. So Broca's and Wernicke's are only on the left hemisphere. That's where your language centers reside. When you're younger, when you're like two, three years of age, you, you use both hemispheres almost equally. But remember, you have that separation that occurs as we get older and we mature, and the, the right side and the left side of the brain start to specialize. Okay? Remember, we talked about that. We talked about if you grew up learning a second language, right, and you knew that before when you were very young, three, four, five, ten, up to the age of ten, um, you probably have very little accent in both of those languages. You'd probably go back and forth without too much um, language accent, okay? But it's when you're after, when the, when the hemispheres have, have specialized and the language centers reside on the left side only, um, by the age of 10, 11, and 12, uh, then it becomes a little bit more difficult uh, to create de novo from scratch, another language in its native tongue. Okay. All right, and then the cerebellum. So this is a really helpful picture for you to study. If you can label all of these different areas and tell us what they do, so, for example, if I said, what happens if there was a stroke or damage due to a car accident to Region 9? And I could ask the question, what is Region 9? Or I could say, what, is region nine? what, what would the resulting injury be? So, what is Region 9? Cerebellum. Cerebellum. And, and what, what effects do you think would be uh, realized if you had damage to the cerebellum? Some balance issues, okay? There's some uh, uh, roles that it plays on keeping passage, uh, keeping track of the passage of time. So you might see some issues with trying to remember was that before? Have I done that yet? When was that? Okay, not being able to place when that exact event event took place. Okay, was that before the wedding? Was that after? <coughs> was that before Uncle George passed away? Or when they moved to Colorado, you know, you may not remember exactly that passage of time. Okay, so here's the key, because I know the next question is, are you going to tell us what the answers are? You should be able to know them by now. If you do not know these by now, then you have some work to do. You had too much fun over spring break. Okay, now it's time to focus. Guys, there's still quite a bit of time in the semester left. We just passed midterm grades. Okay, so now is not the time to say, oh, the semester's over, I'm done. Right? We, we have three exams remaining. We have exam three, we have exam four, and we have exam five. Exam five is the final. 
So we still have most of the class in front of us. Okay? All right. So if that scared you into studying, then good. All right. I want you to be able to identify these functions of these different regions. A little bit redundant. Right? And I also want you to be familiar with these internal brain parts. We talked about some of the internal structures as well in the last few lectures. None of this should be new. If there's something on here that you are very confused about, I, you might have dozed off in the lecture, maybe you missed that lecture, I would watch the YouTube lecture again, or I would definitely go to SI and get this cleared up. Okay, so this is just a little review to get us queued up from, uh, for today's final lecture on where we've already been. All right, so before I, uh, I go on, and before I forget, um, Jody, where is your um, SI session tomorrow? I think that's the last piece of information we need to know. Chem 117 is Jody's SI session tomorrow. 113 or 113? 117 minus 4. We're just testing to see how aggressive spring break was. Okay. For Jody, it was pretty aggressive, apparently. All right. 113. Chem 113. And today you're going over lecture, and tomorrow you're going over the practice exam. And we're going to have answers to the practice exam posted after tomorrow's session. Okay? The whole goal of the practice exam, guys, is that you take it. Like you practice examination. Okay? I just made up that word. But that's okay. Some of you are asleep, so you wouldn't even know. So wake up the person next to you, because we're about ready to start our new material. Okay. I want you to turn to the person sitting behind the person in front of you and say this. What, what, what? That, that's you. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh, I'm like really not ready for this week. The person sitting behind the person in front of you is you. All right. All right, you ready? Are you guys awake? Man, you guys. All right, let's check it off. Come on. Everybody stand up. Stand up. Come on. You guys need to stand up. I don't have a whistle, I promise. Come on, stand up. Stand up, please. Let's go. Alright, big stretch. Come on, big stretch. Alright. All right, turn to somebody next to you because you failed at that first piece of instruction. And say, we can do this. <laughs> All right, sit down. So this is our last piece. Guys, this is our last piece before uh, we move on into the next year. And what I have been trying to get across to you is how well the nervous system can identify flickering images on a screen. How fast <laughs> Carrie is getting down here. I saw you come out and I'm like, what am I doing wrong? And then I realized that it's flickering. So as she's switching out our, our images, let's talk a little bit about the impact and the importance of, of the nervous system, where we are and where we've been. We've been talking about um, action potentials. We've been talking about nerves in general. We've been talking primarily about them within the context of the central nervous system. This is where lab and lecture are not nearly close to each other because you did the brain dissection weeks ago. Okay? But we can parallel track in the sense of reminding you of where we were and some of the topics that we covered. So the nervous system in the CNS... It's made up of the brain and the spinal cord. We spend a lot of time in the brain. We're going to dance a little bit here. And now we're going to be in the spinal cord. Okay? So the spinal cord is the extension of the central nervous system as it gets out near or closer to the periphery. Because in order to interact with the periphery, in order to interact with muscles and glands and effector organs of the periphery, you need to be able to send nerve signals out and you need to be able to receive nerve signals back in. And so after the exam on Wednesday, when we come back, 
we're going to get into reflexes. And we're talking about these reflex arcs. And you're going to start seeing the circuitry where it's the nerve coming out, okay, going to an effector organ, and that effector organ has a nerve coming in to the central nervous system, the spinal cord. And that information creates this arc very rapidly, and it does it so that you can respond even faster than the information is sent upward to the brain. The brain and the, central, uh, and, and the spinal cord are part of the central nervous system, but the spinal cord is out near the periphery, so it can actually respond to a lot of these reflexes much faster. We say that there are four main characteristics of a reflex, right? What are they? You guys remember this from some of the worksheet material? What's that? It's involuntary, right? So you touch something hot or sharp and you, you withdraw quickly. You withdraw faster than even realizing like, ooh, that's hot. Have you ever done that? You burn yourself. You withdraw even faster than realizing I just burnt myself. Because the conscious awareness of what just happened has to be up here. And your reflex arc is happening down here much faster to withdraw to protect you as an organism. So it's involuntary. What else? Stereotypical. What does that mean? What's that? It happens the same way every time. Okay? What else? It's unstoppable. It is unstoppable in the sense that once it fires, but that's more of a characteristic of an action potential. So it, it, it's, not, not, it's, it's not incorrect. It's just not one of the main characteristics that we would lump into uh, reflexes. So we have involuntary, we have stereotypical, we have what? Hard to suppress. Did you guys not do the worksheet yet? No. Not yet? <laughs> okay, um, but it's not one of the characteristics. It still works, so a lot of these reflexes will still work. <clears throat> so we say that they're um, fast. Okay, they're rapid. Okay? We say that they're fast, we say that they're stereotypical, we say that they're involuntary, and we also say that they're predictable. So, we're still kind of waiting for our slide to come up. We have three main segments of the spinal cord. Our three main segments of the spinal cord are what? Cervical up top, thoracic in the chest area, and lumbar in the lower back. And if we take a look at these areas and the functions of the spinal cord, there are three main functions on these slides you have in front of you, okay? You don't have them in front of you, you're just going to have to imagine what they would look like in the blue background. <clears throat> Number one, the spinal cord functions to coordinate these reflexes that I'm talking about. <coughs> Number two, the spinal cord facilitates locomotion. That's movement, the ability for movement to take place. Locomotion. There are central, central pattern generators, right? These are pattern generators that are pre-programmed by the arrangement of the nerves as they go to the spinal cord and as they come out of the spinal cord towards the effector organ. Number three, it allows for the transfer of information between the central nervous system and the periphery and back to the central nervous system. So this exchange of information from CNS to the PNS and then back to the CNS. Now, like the brain, we actually have, bless you, we don't have bless you, we just have three potential layers, okay? We have three meningeal layers uh, like we had at the brain, and what are those meningeal layers if we go from the superficial most to the deepest most layer? Dura, and then we have our arachnoid, and then we have our pia mater. And those are contiguous with the layers of the brain. They're the same layers. Because the brain and the spinal cord, the spinal cord is a natural extension of the brain stem. And so those tissue layers actually extend inferiorly as you wrap the spinal cord as well. So we talked about the circulation of cerebral spinal fluid. You remember Runa Begum, the, the young uh, Indian girl that we looked at with the hydrocephalus? 
and she had too much fluid not draining in the subarachnoid space. Well, it also wasn't draining in the subarachnoid space around the spinal cord. And it happens to be that meningitis that you might come in, uh, come in contact with clinically, that is an infection of those meningeal layers. And that meningitis could affect anywhere down the spinal cord all the way up throughout the brain. So our meningeal layers are in similar orientation is what we find in our brain. If we look at the different regions, and if we look from a side view, okay, if you look from a side view of the different regions, we have our cervical region up top, we have our thoracic region in the middle, and then we have our lumbar region down low. If, we're fa if I'm facing this way, we have a natural curvature, right, of the cervical that comes out like this. This is called cervical lordosis. So from the anterior aspect, cervical lordosis means that you're going to have a convex curve on the cervical region. Okay? And then the thoracic region is called kyphosis, thoracic kyphosis. And that means from the anterior region, it's convex. Excuse me, concave. So convex is cervical lordosis. Concave is thoracic kyphosis. And then down low here, we also move again back to the same orientation that we found uh, in the neck, and we have lumbar lordosis. And that's convex from the anterior aspect as it points this way. Okay? We talked earlier in the semester about how the different curves form based upon Wolf's Law. You guys remember that? So in the body, when we develop... Oh, here we go. In the body, when we develop, we have a spine that's curved like this, right? It's like a C-shaped spine. And then as we age and we start moving around and lifting our head, then we get this cervical lordosis, and the spine starts modeling in this direction. Now, we can talk about injuries, and that's what we're going to do here today, is we're talking about injuries in the three different locations. Um, and then later in life when we start walking and we push our hips underneath our head, arms, and trunk, then we get this curvature, the lumbar lordosis, again convex, pointed this way from the anterior aspect, because this weight shifts and it moves underneath all of this, and so now you have the spine doing this up top, this in the middle, and then this down low. And all of those different curvatures and architectures can be impacted with different states of disease. Okay, so that's what we're going to take a peek at. Now, the first one that we want to talk about disease-wise, or in an altered state, is going to be our cervical region. Now, this is mostly between C1 and C2, and we're not going to nearly be able to cover all the different disorders that happen here. This is an introductory course. But as you move on, we'll talk about more of these types of disorders as we move throughout the body. But if we look at C1 and C2, right, we have the atlas as C1. We have the axis as C2. And are we good to go? Oh, sweet. You guys are wonderful. So I am here. No, I am here. If we look at our cervical spine and we look at our two, not most important, but the ones that we're going to focus on today, C1 and C2, the cervical spine, it supports the head, but it needs a large range of motion to be able to do all the things that we do. Take a look to see who's, you know, walking beside you. Uh, check your blind spots before you make a turn. So we have a large range of motion that's needed, but we have to uh, balance that with the need or the necessity uh, to be able to support the head. And a lot of times what you're going to see in the body is uh, you can't have both. You can't have mobility and have a tremendous amount of stability at the same time. They sort of go against each other. If you want a lot of mobility, the ability to move a joint you can't have it to be super stable. If it's super stable, don't make it move. Does that make sense? Right. 
So having a tremendous amount of mobility here, but having a balance of stability so that you can keep things functionally in place is a tough task. And that's why it's susceptible to damage. And so the damage that occurs really focuses on these two guys, Atlas C1 and Axis C2. The uh, Atlas supports the skull. It allows for movement in the sagittal plane and allows you to facilitate this nodding of the head. Yes. C2, in contrast, C2 fits underneath or inferiorly below C1. And this dense, this pointy process fits up through C1. And then you attach it via ligaments. And these ligaments are going to attach bone to bone. And so that's how you, in a suspender-like approach, put these two pieces in place. The C2 allows, in the transverse plane, shaking the head no. If we look at how they fit together, you can see here's our dense, or otherwise known as our adoptoid process. And there are alar ligaments that attach to that that we're going to see in a second. And there's a transverse ligament that comes right across the front. If we look at um, a top-down view and we did a cross-section through the dens, and that's why you see a little bit of this bony material, you've cut through the dens. And now you're at the level of these alar ligaments, and you have one on either side. So you have really three main suspensatory ligaments at the level of the cervical <coughs> spine. And for the most part, C3 through C7 doesn't move nearly that much at all. And can you do some things lower? Yeah. But most of that activity happens here, and it gives you the ability to move your head in all these different directions. Okay? But these ligaments are very susceptible to damage. Okay? Yes? This is, so this view is if I had um, C1 and C2 like this, and then I turned it like so, and the dens is pointing up right here, and I just lop off the top of the dens. That's it. And I just lopped off the, the very top of it, not touching the alar ligaments that come off the side. Okay? So where do you see damage occurring to, to these ligaments? Well, you see these in motor vehicle accidents. This is going to be the most common neck injury to this highly mobile region of the cervical spine. Highly mobile region of the cervical spine is subjected to whiplash injury when patients or individuals are rear-ended in a collision. And the most aggressive Disruption occurs when the head is turned one direction or the other. Because you can imagine when it's turned one direction or the other, think about what's happening to this alar ligament if you turn the head one direction. You make it really tight. So if you're here, you make it tight and then you get hit from behind, it's a lot easier to tear or injure that ligament that's actually under tension. Okay, so the most aggressive whiplash injuries are when patients are sitting there and they're going, oh, no, 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 they're looking back, right? And, and they see the car coming, and that's when they get hit, and that's when their injury takes place. So the ALR ligament is the uh, most commonly injured structure in whiplash injuries. About 66% of the injuries in whiplash patients are this particular ligament. Um, Subluxation is another word for dislocating the joint, so that's a joint that actually can come out of place. And uh, that's a dis dislocation of the Atlanta axial joint. Um, and that will destroy both the alar ligament as well as that transverse ligament that comes across the anterior aspect of the dens. Now if we move on to the thoracic spine. The thoracic spine, again, this maintains the original embryonic C-shape. Remember that C-shape in embryo, in utero, we're sitting here like this. And so the thoracic spine maintains that shape. And so if you look at these um, structures, 
from the side, from a lateral view, you can really appreciate here's two lines that are drawn to exaggerate. Here's the head, the patient's looking this direction. This is the anterior aspect, this is the posterior aspect. And you can see if you connected this portion of that wedge and you connected that portion, this segment is much smaller than this segment. So that's truly like a wedge shape. Right? Now, developmentally, they develop as a wedge because when you take a turn, you know, if you look at an aerial view of a cul-de-sac, you know, all of the lots on the cul-de-sac are going to be wedge shaped. The front yard is smaller and the backyard is bigger. Or if you look at slices of pie, right, they're going to be wedge shaped. So that the inside radius takes a smaller distance than the outside radius. And that's what you see here is this wedge shape. This is the normal thoracic kyphotic angle. So let me say this very carefully because students tend to miss this on the exam. That's a hint. You should pay attention here. Okay. Again, tell the person sitting behind the person in front of you to listen, right? There is a normal cervical lordosis. There is a normal thoracic kyphosis. Kyphosis sounds like a disease. It's not. If it was a disease like we see in osteoporotic women later in life, we have to add words to this. We say that it's abnormal or exaggerated thor thoracic kyphotic angle or an abnormal or an exaggerated or hyperkyphosis. So kyphosis is not a disease. Don't miss that on the exam. That is normal, especially if I say normal thoracic kyphosis, okay? If you look at this image, and Carrie, in a second, I'm going to need you to dim the lights, not this slide, but the next one. Um, this is showing a woman, and as we age, we have some changes that take place in the density of the bone. And we talked about that previously in a different unit, right? And this could be an example of how some of this cumulative material may come back. What was the disease state in elderly women that we're concerned about? Osteoporosis. And somebody tell me, what is osteoporosis? A loss in bone density. A loss in bone density. Okay, it's actually a loss in bone density below the norm. It's usually two to two and a half times below the normal density of bone at your peak. And your peak is usually between the ages of what? Your peak is usually between the ages of 20 and 30, and then it flattens out, right? And then you don't really drop off the cliff until 40. As the density of the bone decreases over time, what does the weight of the head, arms, and trunk typically do? Does it decrease? Not usually. Even if you lose a little bit of weight or gain a little bit of weight, probably over your lifetime, there's not much change there. So the only thing changing from the left image to the, to the right image is the density of the bone. And as the density of bone decreases and the weight of the head, arms, and trunk of this patient sit there over time, loaded, then you start getting this remodeling that takes place, bless you, of the thoracic kyphotic angle. So now you go from a normal thoracic kyphotic angle to an exaggerated thoracic kyphotic angle. And in this case, you would say that this, or severe, here we go, severe thoracic kyphosis. That is a disease. Severe thoracic kyphosis. Secondary to osteoporosis. What is that? that that's like a lot of fancy words in there. What does that mean? It means the side effect of osteoporosis. Okay, it means it's the side effect of osteoporosis. What is this secondary to? Does anybody want to describe that? That's right. So this is saying that secondary to means after. So osteoporosis happens first, then you get this severe or this exaggerated thoracic kyphotic angle. Okay? Carrie, do you mind dimming the lights for this next image? So what can this uh, look like? Well, if we look here at a radiograph, x-ray, 
Uh, you can see this is at the level of the thoracic spine. The reason that you know that is here are ribs coming diagonally. Okay? You also can see that this anterior length is much smaller than this posterior length. So you know this is a wedge-shaped um, vertebrae, right? Wedge-shaped, so you're seeing wedge-shaped right here. So if we look here, where this arrow is pointing and where this arrow is pointing, we're seeing compression fractures. And you can also probably appreciate that the density of this vertebrae and this vertebrae is not nearly what this one is. Do you see that? So you've got compromised density within these thoracic vertebrae, and that can lead to compression fractures. Okay? As the patient moves throughout the day and moves throughout life, that bone is being loaded, but it's not strong enough to support it. Okay. All right. Um, here we can put the lights back up for a little bit. I'll have another slide here in a second. Uh, if we look at lower down at the lumbar region, the lumbar spine is one of our most susceptible places for injury. It's one of our most susceptible places for injury because of a couple of things. Number one, think about how much weight is on the lumbar spine compared to the cervical spine. A lot more, okay? And then you start doing s stupid things like picking up a box like this, right? Oh. And oh. So what's going on with our lower back or with dad's lower back or mom's lower back? Because I guarantee you in a class this size, somebody has a loved one that has a back issue and it might be actually you. So the lower back is experiencing sustained loads repetitively throughout the day, all day long. And the other thing that you know from lab and the anatomy portion is the vertebrae are separated by these cartilaginous discs. Right Now those cartilaginous discs, uh, they're not indestructible. And they're relatively avascular, so once they're damaged, they don't heal very well. And you also probably remember from, from lab that if you look at the tailbone, the coccyx, right, and if you look at the sacrum, the end of the spine, developmentally those are individual vertebrae. And they fuse throughout our life because there's no cartilage in between them. So the cartilage that separates our vertebrae in our cervical, thoracic, and our lumbar <coughs> have a spacing ability to keep segmentation. So if you see the um, sort of oval structures here, they have a little bit of dark black around them, and then there's a little bit of gray shading in between. Those are the individual vertebrae, uh, or sorry, the individual intervertebral discs. So the ability for us to do all of these kind of complex movements is because we actually have this spine that segments out. But at the level of the sacrum and the coccyx, there's not much movement happening here in us. And so you don't invest the biologic energy to segment it out with cartilage. And so early in life, and definitely by the age of this classroom, the average age of this classroom, you actually just have a fused coccyx and sacrum. But as we get older, it's not uncommon, especially in these lower vertebrae, for that vertebral disc to wear out. And as it wears out, you're going to get fusion happening naturally from one vertebrae to another. It's going to limit motion. And one of the treatments when the disc blows is for the surgeon to come in, extract out all the disc material, deaden all the nerves in the area, and go ahead and put appliances in and fuse the spine anyway. Okay. So this is an area that uh, we have a lot of injuries with as a result of how many um, repetitive loads happen throughout the day. Again, it's this balance between mobility and stability. You know, we want to be able to move, so you have this segmentation. And sometimes students ask, well, that seems like a weak point. Why don't we just have a whole fused spine? Well, if you lived long enough, you would. <coughs> It's not uncommon in autopsy to pull spine out of a cadaver and see 
fusion of vertebrae that have taken place sort of naturally over the age of the patient because the disc has eroded. Is that why old people are typically a lot slower than young people? Is because they're the their, their, I'm sorry, their lumbar vertebrae started to... Slower or smaller? Slower. Is that why usually old people are slow, like walking and things like that? Because their, oh. their lumbar vertebrae are starting to fuse. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the tissues kind of wear out as we age, so that's one of the reasons they're slower. Um, the, uh, uh, the other fact that I thought you were going to was we, we actually lose height as we get older. I knew that. So as, as, as we... <laughs> Lose our, stay with me guys, come on. If we lose our disc, right, if we lose our disc because of compression, you lose height. So you're actually probably a little bit taller in the morning uh, than you are in the evening, right? So I'm, I'm almost six foot in the morning when I wake up. So by the time I see you guys, it's been a rough day, okay? Okay. I wasn't supposed to be funny. All right, let's talk about... Injuries that happen here. Yes. Real quick for you, Juan, the normal thoracic kyphosis going to an exaggerated or severe state, is that something that we can combat, or is that something we expect over, over aging? Well, so the question is, can you um, slow down or eliminate a normal kyphotic angle turning into an exaggerated or severe <coughs> kyphotic angle? And, and the answer to that is, is not really. Um, really, the main cause of it is acceleration of osteoporosis. So really, the way to combat it is to by treating osteoporosis. And the best treatment for osteoporosis is actually education. Is to inform our patients that bone health is something you need to be paying attention to when you're very young. Right? And so that's why a lot of these programs about nutrition in the classroom, or in the schools, or in the lunchroom, in the cafeteria, sending out information to mom and dad, saying, why does my kindergartner, or my seven-year-old, or my eight-year-old need to be worried about getting the right nutrition? It's not just so that they grow healthy, it's also so that their bones are actually growing appropriately. You know, by the time you're in this classroom, and you have the mental capacity to understand what are the implications, it's too late. There's not much that we can do to our own bodies now to modify bone density in a serious or a significant way. Does it mean you should do whatever you want and not worry about it? No. But it means that the, the sweet spot of making big impacts is already passed. But if you move on and educate others, or if you move on and have your own families, then the education actually works. Okay, so that's why there's big programs in schools, in the cafeterias, in the lunchrooms. That's where actually the biggest difference makes. And it's not just, you know, with these programs of getting kids to exercise. That's not just so we don't have fat kids. No, I'm, I'm dead serious, guys. I'm, I'm not trying to be funny. I mean, a lot of times you think, oh, our, we have obesity problem in the United States. We have an obesity issue. But that is not just trying to curb obesity. <laughs> That is also, if you have more active children, they're going to sleep better. That means you only grow when you sleep, right? That's when you grow is when you sleep. Um, so you're going to sleep better. The kids are going to grow better. Their bones are going to be healthier because they're being active. So it's not just about let's make our nation slimmer. No, it, it actually is a, is a health issue. It's not really a body type issue. Long-term health. Yes, long-term health investment. That's, so, that's a great question. The question is, when they uh, take the ruptured disc or the damaged disc out, uh, I'm going to repeat it because I have people in the back right here. Uh, why, why do they fuse it? Why don't they put in an artificial disc? And um, so 10 years ago, there were no options. So nobody asked that. Nobody developed that. Now people are asking those questions. And there are artificial type of disc materials that are being implanted now. Spacers, okay, and they're putting some things in there. Many times they'll still go ahead and fuse for stability, and they put the disc in for um, maintaining the spacing so that, that you don't continue to get erosion between. You have like a spacer that comes in. But now more research is being spent on how do we make replacement discs. Okay? But it's not easy. These discs are fascinating. In fact, they have um, uh, 
I, let me see if I have, I don't think I have a picture in this lecture. Um, I don't really have a great picture, so I'm going to have to describe it. But here is our disc in our herniated situation. I'm going to describe the architecture of the disc. So here's a healthy disc, here's a vertebrae, here's a herniated disc. That means, or a bulging disc, okay? A bulging or a herniated disc is really kind of two terms meaning the same thing. That that disc is actually um, extended out of where its normal architectural boundaries should be. Another term would be a slip disc. I have a slip disc. So all of these three terms, uh, a bulging disc, a herniated disc, or a slip disc, would be something that uh, would all be part of the same uh, state or situation. Now, a ruptured disc is different, so hold, hold on for a second. Um, if you take this diagram and you blow this up, uh, this usually, most often, is going to happen between L4 and L5, or L5 and S1. Does that mean it doesn't happen anywhere else, like between L2 and L3? Well, of course, it means it can obviously happen anywhere within the vertebral column. You could have a herniated disc up in the cervical region or the thoracic region. It's more unlikely that you have it in the thoracic region because the rib cage and the, the sternum anchor the spine in place. There's not a whole lot of, you know, if you all stood up and we did this ex exercise and I told you to like bend in half right here, nobody could do it, okay? Because the, the chest cage, the rib cage, prevents a lot of, a lot of movement. Okay? But you can bend down here, you can twist down in the lumbar region, you can move up here in the cervical region. That's where you're most likely to have those ruptures or those slippages. What were the, sorry, what were the um, terms? The, no, L4 and L5. So L4, L5, that spacing, or L5 and S1, okay. which is a little bit more <coughs> inferior, right? You, could you get it between L1 and L2? Yeah, of course. T12 to L1? Yes. It's just not as common. Now, I'm going to show you an actual case here in a second um, that, that highlights this. Okay, so what is the disc? How does it be? So if you look at a disc, if you took a disc out, okay, you would see uh, material that was very um, uh, moist, high amount of water content. And on the outer ring, it's kind of it's like a jelly donut. On the outer ring is a more um, structurally solid architectural pattern with collagen fibers that are kind of interlocking like this. Okay, like have you ever played with a Chinese finger um, toy? Right, and that that interlocking pattern as you pull, it kind of stretches and keeps your fingers from coming out. And as you push in, those things actually loosen. So as we twist, those patterns actually tighten. And as we untwist, they relax. And as we twist in this way, they tighten. And as we untwist in this way, they relax. So kind of like that Chinese finger puzzle is the architecture of the um, annulus. The annulus is the outside area. Inside is the nucleus. And the nucleus is a gelatinous-like material that's actually your compressible jelly-like material. So what happens is when the Chinese finger puzzle um, fibrous annulus tears, you get this gelatinous material that pushes out. Okay? It is, it, it, it is similar, but it's, it's slightly a little bit more specialized. Because in the knee, you actually have a lot of motion and compression, but you don't have any twisting. Okay, so you don't really have, um, these are more robust. Let's put it that way. The, the nucleus annulus, that come, or the annulus fibrosis that comes around um, is a little bit more robust to maintain this twisting capability. Otherwise, every time somebody talks to you, you're like, hey, Rob, you're like, yeah. Right, I mean, you couldn't, you know, have you ever injured your neck and someone calls you and you're like, right? You're doing like a Frankenstein walk. You, you have this ability for motion because of the architecture. Okay, there's a question here, and then I got to go to the back. Um, when you herniate a disc, what are they worried about in your spinal cord? Like, what are they worried about happening? Well, you're the one that tells them that you're worried because it hurts like crazy. Okay, so let's talk about that here in a second.
Yeah, so the question is, if you have a patient who has a scoliosis abnormality, which is usually like a lateral deviation, okay, so if you're, we're talking about lordosis and kyphosis from a lateral view, A and P this way. Scoliosis would be an A and P view here, not a lateral view, and my spine would do something like this, or something like this. Or it could be like this, and then like this. Okay, so, you know, it'd be maybe something like this, or, or, okay? So that would be a scoliosis. And the question is, in those patients, are the discs more susceptible to injury? And the answer is yes. Okay? Now, depending upon the severity of the scoliosis, they may not all be that active to begin with. But if they are active with a slight scoliosis, they may have more long-term problems later in life. So it all, all of this is impact-dependent. Right? So here's one of the crazy things is, if you live an active life, you're more likely to have these issues. Right? Okay, last question, then we have to move on. Do this, like, cause pain yes, so that's what I'm going to talk about here. So that's a perfect segue. Thank you for getting us back on track. Um, <laughs> No, the questions are fantastic, though, so please keep asking. The intervertebral disc, right, this guy lies in front of the spinal nerves, and it's situated between the bodies of, an in, of a superior and an inferior vertebral body. And this is the little space where these spinal nerves sit. Those spinal nerves are part of the periphery. Okay, these are peripheral nerves, so we're starting to segue out of our central nervous system. But these peripheral nerves are going to go somewhere. And if those peripheral nerves are located in that space in the lower back, they're going to go down to the distal extremities. So if you have a bulging disc or a slip disc, or if it's a herniated disc where it's actually ruptured, it's putting pressure on that nerve and that causes pain and discomfort. It could provide a numb and tingly feeling. It could be um, a parathesis. Parathesis is a word that means like that pinprick feeling when your foot goes to sleep. So these patients have that pinprick feeling in their feet or legs all the time. How annoying would that be? Yeah. Okay. And painful and annoying. So th that's what's going on here, and that's what these patients are suffering from. 80% um, of the load that comes down through the vertebral column is going directly through that vertebral disc. Where does the other 20% go? Well, it comes out this direction because these are bony attachments. So 20% of the vector force will actually be redirected around. But if you imagine someone who you know, is running or jumping or jogging a lot, very, very active, that's a lot of impact force on that lower back all day long. And if the patient is slightly overweight, that's even more weight and more force on the vertebral discs. So, so in other words, no movement. If you don't do any exercise, <laughs> the you're screwed if you do, you're screwed if you don't. The osteoblast will take over and eat up your bone. If you do too much exercise, you hurt your thoracic spine. It's, 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 an, no it's an important balance, right? It's an important balance between the two. So can I have the lights again, Carrie? Would you mind? So if we, if we look at... Um, two different imaging technologies, right? Two different imaging technologies that we're going to see. We've got the first one on the left is a CT scanner, a CAT scan. It's a little bit easier to see under the CT scan. Here is the disc normally, and here is this bulge that's coming out. And it's going into this space where those nerves are housed, or where the nerves lie. You can actually appreciate it here um, as the disc right here, and uh, the bulge is this portion right here that's coming out. Okay? So it's easily visible under imaging. What does it look like in a cartoon format? Okay. Well, here's a contained herniated disc, or a slip disc, or a bulging disc. Right? You can see that the nucleus material is bulging out, putting pressure on this nerve. Over on the right side, you can see that the annulus has been torn and the material is coming out. So, what are the treatment options? Well, physical therapy usually does a pretty good job because if you unload the disc on the left side of a contained uh, herniation or a bulge, if you unload the disc and you strengthen the muscle and you modify posture, 
And with training, you can actually allow that disc to reabsorb. Okay? So that's why surgery is not always necessary. Many of you are going to be physical therapists, right? Some of you are going to be surgeons. You'll be like, ah, let's just cut them open. <laughs> well, not always is it necessary to slice and dice, okay? You can actually encourage the body to reabsorb that material if you unload that disc and you work with the patient over time. In a situation here, you're never going to heal this torn annulus, and that's where surgery would be necessary, is if it was actually physically torn. What does the surgery um, look like? Well, uh, this is a, a top-down view, a superior view. They come in and they surgically remove that disc material. Uh, in this situation, they may sew up the annulus or just allow it to scar over. Um, the, the case usually takes from cut down to closure about an hour. Okay, maybe 45 minutes on the short end. I know it says half an hour, but I, I, I don't think I've ever heard of that happening that fast. Um, and then, you know, upwards of one and a half to two hours. So a lot of times they're outpatient procedures in this case. Now, if the disc has to be totally removed, and they take the disc out and they're going to reinforce it with appliances, that takes a little bit longer, and that's usually an overnight stay in the hospital. Now, when would that take place, where there's more aggressive? Well, there are some more aggressive cases of herniated discs that we're going to talk about, and it falls in this category of what we call spondylolithesis. Spondylolithesis. Question in the back. prosthetic that's, that's external, that you wear, versus one that's implanted. An implanted prosthetic that helps to space, yeah, I mean, that's what basically what they're doing, is they're implanting appliances to actually separate out the two vertebrae and space them out so you don't get any contraction down, okay? But those are all surgical implants. I mean, some, some patients, you know, will wear back braces when they're lifting, if they do that on a regular basis. To avoid a back injury, that's a really smart thing to do. A lot of uh, companies will require certain types of back braces to be worn in uh, loading docks or in inventory stocking centers and things like that. They also tend to require training so that um, uh, employees are lifting correctly and they're not, they're not doing an action or a motion that's going to be dangerous. But um, those are more external braces and things. All the prosthetic implants you're talking about are all surgically implanted. All right, so this is a forward displacement of the vertebrae. So it slides anteriorly over the inferior vertebral column. The most common place is at the fifth lumbar vertebrae. And it's very common for this to happen after there's been a fracture event that's happened within the spine. Well, so Carrie, can we do dim the light? We're doing the light show today, sorry. So if you look at this particular patient, um, this is like a uh, 1946, so just shy of 70 year old, right? 68 year old male. Uh, you can see here, this was uh, just last summer, uh, July of 13. Uh, and what you're looking at, this is the patient's anterior aspect, this is the posterior aspect, right? A, P. See that? And this is the vertebral column. Look at this region right here. Do you see how this posterior aspect should line up with this? And do you see how much it slid forward? So if I kind of zoom into that region right there, okay, this is spondylolithesis. Um, and this vertebrae has a fracture in it. And it's dissociated, so that disc is actually being torn kind of in the lateral aspect or lateral direction. Spondylolithesis. So probably one of the more common ways you're going to see a slip disc is either a athletic injury or a lifting event. And in the elderly patients, they are not extremely elderly, just 68 years of age, not quite cross 70. You're seeing a patient that maybe this is due to an old break 
or maybe this is this is a male. Maybe this is due to um, loss of bone density because of early onset of osteoporosis, and that anterior portion or the superior portion of the spine is sliding forward. There was a question over there. Uh, yeah. Are you, uh, worried, would you be worried about any spinal cord injury to that? Is it like pulling the spinal cord injury? Well, you would if you would treat, but this. The, so I'm not going to get into the grades. This is probably, they usually grade spinal cord like this is between a 1 and a 5. This is probably like a grade 4. And about a grade 2 is where patients start complaining. So by a 4, this patient couldn't walk around and walk. Um, this patient uh, was, um, uh, it was difficult to sleep at night, difficult to sit for long periods of time. And this is a grade 4, and this patient actually had it fixed, and it looks great. Um, I just need to get the, uh, the CT scans to show you guys. So, you would worry if you left this untreated about further debilitation, but the patients usually, at this point, say, something's not right and I need to get fixed. Okay. All right, lights back up for me, Carrie. Questions over the cervical, thoracic, or lumbar spine. Wait, one second, one second, right here and then. Hold on, guys, stay with me. Let's be polite. Physical therapy. So the question is, does physical therapy ever help spondylolithesis? It can if you catch it early. In like a grade one or a grade two, when you get an early slippage, if you can strengthen the muscles around the spine and rehabilitate, yes. But by the time it gets to a three or a four, it's probably too late for PT. Yes. All right, guys, this is where we're going to stop. So all the material up until here is game on for the exam.